first of all, could I welcome everybody here? Uh, it's wonderful to see such a very large crowd taking an interest in uh, music, in film, which is, I think, uh, where we are today, uh, music licensing uh, and how it works, uh, particularly for uh, film production and screen content production generally. So uh, I would like, first of all, uh, to take this opportunity of thanking uh, IMRO for uh, hosting this event here in IMRO's building and also to thank uh, my uh, colleagues uh, from Screen Training Ireland, particularly Circa Lochnan, who I can't see wherever she's got to, but thank you Circa in particular. Uh, and uh, having said all my thank yous at this stage, uh, the next thing I'd like to do is uh, to start by saying that what we're going to do is have a preliminary presentation, uh, which is a good presentation from uh, JP here, JP Canning from Im IMRO MCPS Ireland, who has a presentation which he's going to make uh, and which uh, is going to go through music licensing, uh, particularly from the point of view of the way MCPS Ireland does it. JP works for, uh, as a senior licensing executive for MCPS Ireland and uh, has worked across different departments in IMRO uh, previously from performance royalty distribution to his current mechanical licensing uh, role, uh, which includes blanket licensing for TV and radio, main broadcast and independent production companies, production music licensing, licenses for program sales, individual sync licenses, CDs and DVDs, uh, and uh, that's very much gives him the background which enables him to make the presentation which he's going to make to you first of all today. After JP has made the presentation, if there are any questions which immediately occur to people, I'm very happy to take them at that stage. Otherwise, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce uh, the panel uh, and give them an opportunity to say a few words themselves. Then uh, when we've done that, uh, we're going to allow each panelist to make a, a short presentation. Uh, and after that, uh, during that, if that's okay with everybody, we will do questions and answers if they arise. So stop me, and if anybody wants to try and, uh, you know, wants to ask a question, please uh, attract my attention and we will, we will get to the questions. Because this is an important opportunity, I think, for everybody to ask the questions they've always wanted to ask uh, in terms of music licensing. Uh, so I think, uh, without further ado, what I'm going to do is ask JP, uh, to start off, and this will give us a quick and, I think, very uh, in-depth in, uh, introduction into music licensing. Uh, JP. Thanks very much. So I guess the idea of this presentation is to give a broad overview of music licensing for audiovisual productions, whether it be for film, TV, that kind of thing. So the table of contents, I'm just going to do a brief synopsis or a brief look at IMRO and MCPS Ireland. Categories for music licensing, publishing and master rights, the difference between the two, commercial music and production music, I'll just zone in on those a little bit more, TV blankets, what they are, how they work, that kind of thing, program sales, so when production companies are selling programs to rest of world territories or broadcasters in other areas, in other territories, music licensing for film, online and advertising, a little bit on traditional, traditional and out of copyright works, and then a little bit on cue sheets and music returns, which we obviously need to distribute the royalties. So IMRO and MCPS Ireland. IMRO is the Irish Music Rights Organisation, and IMRO administers the performing right in Ireland. Also on behalf of its members, but also on behalf of its affiliates as well. So not just IMRO members in Ireland, but anybody else's music that's being broadcast in Ireland, IMRO looks after their rights as well. The same that we would expect if the likes of IMRO members, their music was being broadcast outside of Ireland, in France or Germany or whatever the case might be. So performance royalties are generated when a musical work is performed or broadcast publicly. So performed in a live concert or broadcast on TV or radio, that kind of thing. So you might know a lot about MCPS Ireland. So Mechanical Copyright Protection Society Ireland, by way of an agency agreement with MCPS in the UK, IMRO administers the mechanical rights in Ireland via MCPS Ireland. So mechanical royalties, different from performance royalties, are generated by the copying, duplication, synchronization, or sale of musical works. So as we're focusing in on audio, audio visual, we'll be looking at synchronization more than copying, duplication, or sale. So we'll be zoning in, we're zooming in on synchronization, the sync rights. So MCPSI collect mechanical royalties and license the use of their members' music in film, TV, advertising, video games, and many other forms of media. 
So the categories of music, what I've done is I've split music into three distinct categories and it's really to do with the rights holders. So the first category, setting all genre, genre aside, the first category of music would be commissioned music. So that's when you approach a composer and ask him to write music specifically for your production, a theme tune, jingle, that kind of thing. Anyone can commission music and any type of music can be commissioned. Production music, sometimes called library music, is specific, it's music that's already written and it's specifically written for inclusion in audio or audiovisual productions. It's a cost-effective alternative to commercial music and it's very simple and easy to access and to license. MCPS acts as an exclusive agent and administers the licensing process for over 100 library members. So there's quite a vast array of music that you can choose from, a vast array of production music that you can choose from. So commercial music. Commercial music is generally what you're going to think of. When people think of music, it's generally commercial music. It's any music produced that's been marketed directly to the general public by any medium. So in very, very general terms, commercial music is songs that you'd hear on the radio. That's on very, very, very general terms. But if it's not production music, if you haven't taken it from a library and you haven't asked somebody to write it, more than likely it's commercial music. So publishing and master rights. When you're licensing an existing recording, you need to seek clearance from the two rights holders. So if you're using somebody's recording of a musical work, there are two rights holders. So the publishing rights, that's the use of the original composition. That's whoever wrote the song. So as a, by way of example there, I've used Bob Dylan's track to make you feel my love. So Sony ATV control the publishing for this work. The master rights is the sound recording rights. That's whoever went into the studio and recorded it. So whoever controls the sound recording rights, they're the people who usually facilitate or pay for the recording of the music. So usually record companies will control the master rights for, for recorded media, for recorded songs. So again, by way of example, Adele recorded her version of Bob Dylan's To Make You Feel My Love. So if you wanted to use Adele To Make You Feel My Love in a production or in an, an ad or anything like that, you need to go to Bob Dylan's publisher to ask if you can use the original composition and you need to go to Adele's record company and ask them if you can use her recording. So commercial music, this is just a little flow chart of who controls what rights. And you can see the top half is the original composition right and the bottom half is the sound recording right. So you can see in the slightly green shaded areas, IMRO and PPI look after the performance royalties for both their areas and MCPS or the music publisher and PPI or the record labels look after duplication, synchronization, and dubbing. In the area of PPI, it's referred to as dubbing. Production music, slightly different. MCPS would look after three of the rights, and IMRO would collect and distribute performance royalties for the original composition. So if a song, if let's say, for example, Adele, To Make You Feel My Love, was played on the radio, IMRO collect the performance royalties for the broadcast of that song and pay the performance royalties of the, of the musical work back to Bob Dylan's publishers. PPI would collect the performance royalties for the broadcast of Adele's recording and pay it back to the record companies. So again, that's the who controls the rights for production music. So MCPSI production music there's no pre-clearance required. In other words, you don't need to seek permission in order to use the music. You do obviously need to seek a license, but you don't need to seek permission. Both rights are licensed, so you don't need to clear the publishing separate from the sound recording. The both rights are wrapped up into one. Also, with MCPS production music, it's possible to license worldwide, and there's all media options as well. The music is licensed in perpetuity, so in other words, forever, the lifetime of your production. So you're not constrained to a certain term or whatever the case might be for licensing production music. All of the production music rates are licensed via the rate card. So that's published online on the IMRO website. There's a link to it on the bottom of the page and a link to the rate card in the active link as well in the, in the presentation. So there's plenty of tracks to choose from. There's over 1 million tracks across 100 libraries. Again, that's an active link to a list, an A to Z list of all of the libraries and all of the catalogues that would be covered by the production music rate card. T 
TV blanket licenses. So the main broadcasters are going to have different blanket licenses for different areas. They're going to have a broadcast blanket license to broadcast music, and they're going to have a sync blanket or a dubbing blanket to put music into domestic programs. So the IMRO and PPI broadcast blanket licenses would cover the broadcast of the music out, and the MCPSI and PPI sync and dubbing license would cover putting music into the production itself, so into domestic programs. Independent production company blanket licenses are available for independent producers who are making programs and selling them back to the broadcasters. So the broadcasters will have blanket licenses in place to, uh, for, for the inclusion of music in their own programs. But for any programs that aren't covered under their blanket licenses, in other words, they're made independently and sold back to the broadcaster, there's an independent production company blanket license. Commercial rates would be licensed at per 30 second rates. And production music, again, is licensed by the rate card. So there's IPC rates on the rate card. Um, with, there's an active link as well at the bottom of that page, and that will bring you to IPC blanket licensing page on the IMRO website. Program sales. So if people have made programs, if, if producers have made programs, they've been broadcast in Ireland, and they want to sell it to rest of world territories or broadcasters in other areas, there's a program sales license. Production music, again, is licensed by the rate card, and commercial music would be licensed by this kind of formula here. So it's valuing the music as a percentage of how much music is being used and the gross sale price of the program. So it's a little kind of formula there, but I won't go into it in too much detail other than that. So film, online, and advertising. Again, for production music, just down at the bottom, published rates licensed via the rate card. Commercial music is going to be different. So commercial music, you'll need to clear the publishing with the publisher and the sound recording or master rights with the record company. Usually it's the record company who controls the master rights. For licensing music for film, online productions and advertising, there are no set fees for commercial music. So there are many varying factors which are going to determine how much it's going to cost to put a certain track into your film or your ad or whatever the case might be. When it comes to advertising, the brand, the product, the term, the territory, in other words, how long do you want to license it for? Where is it going to be licensed? Is it going to be licensed? What media is it going to be licensed for? Radio, TV, online, just radio, whatever the case might be. So there's a lot of varying factors when it comes to licensing commercial music for the likes of advertising. With film, it's again, there's no set fees. You could be using music in the opening or closing credits of the film. That's going to, it's going to be valued more. It's going to be seen as more of a valued, valued track. Um, but also it's to do with the overall budget of the film in order to try and value the music. So publishers and record companies are trying to put a value on their music for the use and license it accordingly. A little bit on traditional and out of copyright works. So copyright eventually expires. In Ireland, the life of copyright for musical works is 70 years after the death of the com composer. However, out of copyright works can be brought back into copyright by in copyright arrangements. So in other words, black is the color is an out of copyright work. However, if I do my version of that work and I do my recording of it and my registration of it and you want to use it in your film or your ad, you need to ask my permission to do that and you need to license it from me. So if I do my own registration of an out of copyright work or a traditional work, I'm bringing that work into copyright. I'm bringing my arrangement into copyright. Cue sheets and music returns, it's the boring end of things, but we absolutely need cue sheets and music returns, detailed, uh, the, the music title, composer, publisher, the duration, all of those details we need back in order to distribute the mechanical and the performing royalties. So we need to know what music was used, how long it was used for, in order to we, that we pay the right people. So if I was to summarize music licensing for audiovisual productions in two points, it would be type of music and the two rights holders. So the type of music, what type of music is it that you want to license? Commissioned music, commercial music, or production music? And who are the rights holders? Who controls the rights for, that, for those particular tracks? Who controls the publishing, i.e. the original composition right? And who controls the master rights? So who facilitated or recorded or paid for the recording for somebody to go into the studio and make the recording of that song? 
I've put some contacts here for MCPS Ireland. So the Director of Broadcast Online and International, Sean Donegan, is here. David Galligan is also here, and I am also here. So if anybody has any specific questions afterwards at the end, you can grab any of us. So what I might do now is, before we go to any questions and answers, and by way of illustrating some of the things I was talking about, I'm going to see if this works. I'm going to play some tracks, and I'm going to ask you whether or not they are commercial music, production music, or commissioned music. So let's see if this works. Who said that? Well, that's wrong. So it's not commercial music. Oh, yeah. So. Commercial music, production music, or commission music? Everybody would think that's commission music because it's well known as the theme tune from Mastermind. It's production music. So that was written before it was chosen as the theme tune for Mastermind. So it's available on the EMI production music website. So again, that was written. Somebody heard it. Somebody picked it, put it on as a theme tune for Mastermind, and it's, everybody would think that that's a commissioned work, that it was written specifically for the for the use in Mastermind, but it wasn't. This one? Is commissioned music, yeah. So if somebody, that is commissioned music in the sense that because it's the theme tune for the A-Team, somebody wrote that as the theme tune for the A-Team. But if they wanted to use that outside of context, so in other words, if somebody wanted to use that in an ad, it would be treated as commercial music, and you'd need to see clearance from the publisher, and you'd need to see clearance from the master rights holder. So, so I'm looking for the artist here. The Shy Lights, but very close. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's not Beyonce. That was a, I was hoping everyone would say Beyonce. So it's Beyonce sampled that track, but it's a Shy Lights track. So again, if you wanted to use that, it's actually been used in an ad at the moment, and I think it's a clever bit of music licensing, because obviously people would associate that music or that, just that sample with Beyonce, but it's not Beyonce. It's the Shy Lights from 1971. So this one. If it plays. So the artist and the song and the composer tried arranged. But that is a traditional work, not arranged by Metallica. It's arranged by Thin Lizzy. So that's an out of copyright work that somebody has done their arrangement of, and somebody else has done a recording of an in copyright arrangement. So if that, if that song gets played on the radio, Imro collect performance royalties on the original composition and pay them back to Thin Lizzy's r registration and arrangement. And PPI would collect the master rights or performance royalties and pay them back to Metallica because they recorded it. So I think that's actually it for me for the moment. So <laughs> just want to say thank, thanks very much. Um, thank you very much, JP. That was a, definitely a top tour uh, of music licensing. Um, are there any questions that anybody has at this stage? I mean, if there's something oh, specific that people have a question about, I'm happy to take it with JP at this stage. 
or we can move on and come back to questions at the end of the... Uh, maybe I think, unless anybody has a specific question, I'm going to keep... Sorry. Can I just check the notes that are uh, up here, they're going to be available on the PDF, are they? Yes, so there's a link to the PDF here. You can download that uh, as a PDF from the MRO website. That's the active link there. So as I say, all the information will be in that. Yeah, cool. All right, listen, thank you, Great. JP. Take a, take a cool. seat over there. And uh, what I'm going to do is just ask, introduce and ask the panel uh, to just introduce themselves, actually, in a few words, first of all. But before I do that, I mean, I'd like to say on behalf of um, the Irish Film Board that for us, uh, the importance of music uh, in relation to any film production is uh, a, a huge part and a vitally important part of any film production that we're involved in. Uh, music, as we all know, is something where you best understand how important it is if you look at a film, as I often have to do, uh, which is in a rough cut stage without the music or with sample music or whatever other music is attached. And you realize then very quickly how much music adds to a feature film, how much it adds to a TV drama, uh, how much it adds to TV animation, uh, and how much it can add to any form of screen content in terms of giving the kind of impact uh, which the screen content itself uh, can in part deliver, but with the music can so wholly deliver that you recognize what a vital part of the whole thing is music. The second thing is I'd like to say is that from our point of view as the Irish Film Board, we want as far as possible to encourage uh, the development of Irish uh, composers working uh, in audiovisual content and screen content uh, and for us uh, we uh, as an agency very much support the development of creative talent overall we're very keen to see Irish screenwriters Irish directors uh, Irish uh, performers uh, Irish uh, personnel in other uh, parts of the uh, project but also what we want to see very much is developing uh, works from indigenous uh, composers uh, working in Ireland as well too and that's very much part of what we see as the developing part of the way in which uh, the industry can grow and strengthen. So from my point of view, um, creative talent working in film goes all the way across the spectrum to screenwriters, directors, but also very significantly music composers uh, who are hopefully going to be the people who are going to be commissioned to write work for film. So that's very much what we would like to say. And having said that, could I then start by going to our various panel members? If I could first of all uh, introduce uh, Nikki Gogan and ask Nikki to say a few words of introduction about herself. Thanks, James. Um, Nikki Gogan, I'm a producer and sometimes director. Uh, I've worked for about 10 years in film and TV, and I've worked a lot in documentaries, feature documentaries. I'm going to talk a little bit about one of ours, which is a music doc. Um, animation, and I'm also now working with uh, Pranabar, uh, who's with an animation company in Dublin, and we're producing our first series of animated kids TV, which is exciting. So I've worked in a variety of with composers, and with commercial music and licensing and everything in between over my career, I guess. So thanks. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, could I go to our, our next uh, uh, panelist, uh, Dina Cochran? Dina, introduce yourself. Um, I'm Dina, and I'm a music supervisor. I've been working as a music supervisor for about 20 years. Um, I started working in the States at a network called Oxygen. It's a women's network. And I was responsible for helping to start the music department there and basically overseeing anything that was music related. So music supervising films, TV shows, promos, special projects, concerts. That was kind of, I was responsible for all of that. Um, and then more recently, I'm obviously living here now in Ireland and um, have been working on projects here. So uh, most recently, we're um, working on the Young Offenders TV series with Ray. Um, and I worked on the film as well, uh, worked on the Queen of Ireland and a couple more projects coming up in 2018. So that's really, I guess, a quick overview of what I do. But really, my, my job is to work with the productions um, to any music needs that they have, if it's you know, licensing music, coming up with song ideas, um, pitching those, and then researching the rights, getting the rights for the productions, and advising them on, you know, based on their budgets, advising them on what makes sense for, you know, the rights they're going after, et cetera. That's, that's <coughs> what I'm there for for them, for the projects. Thank you, Dina. Uh, could I now go to Ray, if I could ask Ray Harmon to introduce himself? Thanks, James. Uh, my name is Ray. I, I'm a composer for film and television. I've been doing it for about 25 years. Prior to that, I was uh, 
uh, a guitar player and songwriter in, in a band, something happens. Uh, I've worked on uh, Young Offenders, uh, lots of TV series, documentaries, comedies. Uh, uh, Love, Hate uh, is, is probably one of the best known ones, I suppose. Um, and uh, my my job, I work directly with the mostly with the with the director, um, and try and uh, feed his thoughts into the film and encapsulate what he wants uh, the the show to sound like. Uh, in in musical form, um, so yeah, that's it. That's 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 the job of a composer. Thanks, Ray. And uh, finally, but last by by no means least, Luke Luke Griffin from PPI. Hi, how are you doing? Yeah, my name is Luke. So um, principally, my job as distribution and membership manager, we work for the record labels, um, but also for self releasing um, self releasing artists who own the sound recording. Um, I think JP gave a good sort of oversight as to what we do and the, the licensing that, that we cover. Um, mostly my day-to-day -day work um, involves working with the radio stations, processing um, airplays, etc. We also would tie in with, uh, p with producers and we try and be their link between the, the owners, which is, which is the record companies. So we try and you know, put them in contact, identify the rights holders and so that they can get the licensing that they need. We also have, you know, we regularly receive like the QCs that, that JP had there. And we would clear our member sound recordings um, for domestically produced, uh, domestically produced shows. Um, and then we would obviously advise producers as to their obligations, um, you know, whether, whether we can or not cover it, if it's outside of our remit, um, when we sort of point them in the right direction. So that's, that's essentially what, what we do. Thanks, Luke. Um, if I could suggest now that uh, what uh, we might do is ask the panelists uh, to give some uh, experiences they've had in relation to music licensing and how it's particularly worked for them uh, in the various ways in which they're involved in this process. If I could go to you first, Nikki. Yeah, could you so give us a kind of a yeah, sense? I have, um, I have a clip I want to show you guys to kind of illustrate something that um, when we were doing... Oh, I have a mic here, isn't that working? <laughs> How's that? Is that right? Testing, testing. No? Um, yeah. Can you hear me a little bit? Okay. Uh, so the reason I was oh okay the reason I was invited on here to the talk on the panel I, is because I recently made a film called Lots and Fans, which is a, a documentary about Glasgow indie music. And as part of that production, we licensed a huge amount of tracks. I think about twenty five in total. Um, and uh, one of the things that enabled us to have such a volume of music in the documentary, so it, it was the music was from bands as big as. Um, Franz Ferdinand and Mogwai to small little indie bands that were on the label Chemical Underground, which and also bands that were on no label that were like punk rock bands from the kind of mid nineties as well. Recordings of them playing in basements and stuff, so it was really hard to like, track down, you know, who owned those rights, and we eventually did, you know. So kind of the whole gamut from like super super stadium stars to little artists in basements who hadn't recorded anything for twenty years. Um, and one of the things that enabled us to do this, this is a documentary, so there's obviously a kind of limited budget, you know? So, <coughs> I'm a producer, of course, the first thing I'm talking about is the budget. But in order for us to be able to kind of have the scope we wanted to in the edit, um, with, in documentaries, more often than not, the film is created in the edit. So we didn't want to have a limit, in a way, or as much as possible, uh, as to what music we used. So, what we did read is all, we knew all the bands that were going to be in the film, because we'd made, obviously recorded them, for the most part, and they came on this journey back to France with us. We basically brought all the bands on a bus back to France, this little town where they'd all played 20 years before, and that was the premise of the, of the story, the film. And um, we did a, something that was called the Most Favoured Nations deal, which basically meant that we agreed um, a fee for the mechanical rights and the publishing across all the different publishers and labels and individuals too, because often the music was owned by the individuals at that point. Um, to, so basically what that means is we'd agreed a fee of a thousand pounds for each side, which meant like, so even though we were dealing with U Music and BMG um, and then Rock Action and Chemical Underground, obviously for their, their songs, they, nobody could charge us more than a thousand euros. And if anybody did, then everybody else would get paid more, you know? So it's just kind of a, a sort of a deal that we did, which meant that 
uh, was brilliant, you know. It meant that the smaller artists got paid a decent amount of money for their music and also meant that, you know, the, the bigger artists like Franz, like you music for Franz Ferdinand, couldn't go, well, we're actually going to charge you 10 grand to use a clip, you know, of Jacqueline or whatever. So basically uh, that allowed us to sort of have a kind of freedom within the sort of edit, which was really helpful and think made the film what it, what it was. So um, I want to show you a clip. Um, uh, it's a clip. Hang on, let me tell you which one it is. Uh, three, please. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll uh, I'll tell you why this is relevant to that particular style of production after if it works. Okay, I'll keep talking. So the reason why this is relevant <laughs> is uh, um, basically. This is Mogwai, Mogwai Fear Satan, this track, which is a really epic track. And we did a live recording of it. And it was one of the first shoots we ever did. Actually, we went to Glasgow and we shot Mogwai playing live. And it wasn't until, so we finished the film, we were literally in our sound mix up in Armour Studios. And we were mixing this part of the film. And um, uh, our wonderful sound mixer was like, uh, we can't use this recording, and we were like, why? Like, you know, and we'd you know done all the deal with everybody, and, and in this in this case, we were paying the publishing, but not the for the mechanical rights because it was our own recording of the song, and uh, he's, it's, it was too distorted, you know, because I don't know if any of you know Mogwai, they're one of the loudest bands in the world, <laughs> um, and yeah, so basically we had to get on to Rock Action, their label, and um, talk, uh, ask them would did they have a live recording of this song because we needed to sync it up with this live performance. And they did have one on an album that they then licensed to us, but it was we had our no fa most favorite nation steal and play to them. So they happily gave it to us. I mean, the film is pretty much about them. So you know, but uh, but it was one of those kind of moments where you're kind of glad that you know you had this sort of uh, structure in place on the production. So, but um, just to Nikki, could I just ask you about the most favoured nations deal? Yeah. So, in order to do that, did you approach like the bigger labels first, yeah. or the smaller labels first? And did you approach the publishing or the or the master side? What way? What way did you do it? Um, we started off with Rock Action, um, when we did a different deal, deal with Chemical, because we used a lot of their uh, bands, and the film is essentially about Chemical Underground. So, we Rock Action were the first ones. Because you know we were, had met Stuart Braithwaite, he features a lot in the film. They own their own recordings. They, the band own their label. That's their own label. So we did a deal with them, and they were like, "Okay, we'd be happy with a thousand pounds," you know. And so then when we talked to U Music and BMG, we were able to say, "Well, Rock Action are giving us more way for Satan," and some of their like huge hits, you know, for this amount, you know, because it's a small independent documentary, you know. And also Mogwai are, are, are very, obviously, TV and film friendly. Not obviously, maybe you don't know, but they've written a lot of soundtracks for TV and film as well. And they're kind of really comfortable in that kind of space, and they kind of know. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of how we started it all. Just coming back to this, so therefore, you, you end up with a feature documentary film. Mm. You have a music cue sheet, and it has yeah. 25 tracks down yeah. with the time for each one. And there was a deal done with each of the music publishers on the one hand and the sound, the master recording owners on the other hand. Yeah. And you were able to do a favorite nations deal, which meant that you only paid to any music publisher a thousand pounds and any sound recording, master recording owner a thousand uh, pounds. That obviously from the point of view of a very, very deeply music orientated film is a wonderful thing to be able to do <laughs> in terms of being able to deliver yeah. because of the risks. It's a it's a very you have to start out in life doing it that way. Though, yeah, don't you? yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah, and one of the other things um, to say because because as I said, the film is very much about Chemical Underground. We also we you know did a deal with them and you know paid a lot of their smaller artists and we brought them on tour and stuff. And we also gave Chemical um, a percentage of producers net profits as well for participating uh, in the film too. So there was back end as well involved <coughs> in that, by the way. And the, obviously. Alex Kafanis didn't care about that, you know, but for Chemical Underground, that meant, it meant a lot, you know, so that we did, yeah, so it was very much a collaboration, I think, you know, and we all wanted the film to happen, and this is kind of where we ended up, you know. Yeah. yeah. But that's particularly the challenge that uh, people face, uh, and we certainly find it that if people, uh, if producers in particular are making films where they want to license in a <coughs> large number of third party uh, music tracks mm. and master recordings, 
this is something then for which an enormous amount of preparation has to go into. Yeah. Clearly, you started early with all of this. We did, yeah, yeah. No, we did. We had, um, I mean, you know, Caroline that works with me. We had um, my good friend Caroline kind of working away, chatting to people. But it was sort of the beginning of the whole conversation about the documentary was talking to Chemical Underground and Stuart from Braithwaite and, you know, Alex from France and other kind of players to participate in the f documentary in the first place. So the kind of talk about music did continue on. But another thing to, ask, to add, I suppose, in terms of having a relationship with the artist is really, is really good because we were literally in the edit and we used Jacqueline um, from Franz Ferdinand in three different places as well. They didn't give us a time limit on some of the tracks as well, which is really great. Um, basically, we were kind of one, supposed to be locking picture. We hadn't had an answer from New Music. They were very hard to kind of get to for some reason. And being able to phone Alex and go, look, sorry to be annoying. I hadn't seen the man for six months since we were in France for three days together. I was like, see ya. And then <laughs> like six months later go, would you be able to maybe give them a nudge, you know, because we hadn't got a formal, yes, you can license this track, you know, hence having a music <laughs> producer on the project would have been really good. We were kind of doing it all ourselves and kind of tend to like to do in still films. But anyway, um, yeah, and he was in his manager's office at the time and literally within an hour, Caroline had got the call from New Music said that we could do it. Otherwise, you would have to pull this whole big scene which you'd built up to Alex and him playing Jacqueline. So anyway. there, are, there are certain risks attached yeah, yeah, to yeah. this particular strategy because <laughs> in the end, yeah. you are forced to stick to the deal that you've done at the beginning. Yeah. And if you have a change of plan, that exactly. becomes very difficult. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is why I wanted to show this. It's not going to work now. That's okay. But basically, I wanted to show you the, the track Mogwai Fear Satan, if you could tell the difference between the licensed recording of the music and our live one. Anyway, you'll have to just go and get the film on the poster. Which I strongly recommend. Yes. Is there an additional clause if it went to Amazon and Netflix? Uh, no, it was all kind of bought out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, these. That's yeah. kind of what we do the back end for the smaller yeah, labels yeah. for. Do you know what I mean? If it, did do, if it did happen to do well, then they definitely would get a bit a few more quid. Do you know what I mean? So. And it's worth clarifying that you, you got all the rights from both the music publishers and the master recording owners <coughs> on a worldwide uh, oh, all-media in perpetuity yeah. basis because that's something you have to do in order to be able to do a deal with, for example, Exactly, Netflix yeah, or yeah. It's kind of worthless. We're not worthless without that. I mean, you know, it is. I mean, you always aspire that your film and TV shows will, will travel, you know, I guess so. Yeah. Um, could I go to maybe Luke next, uh, just to give another perspective? This is coming from the other end of the spectrum in, in the sense that you're the one licensing it to uh, producers or you're involved in advising them where to go. Okay, so again, it's quite well limited. It, like We don't license the likes of advertising or film, um, but again, we can steer people in the direction of where they should be, where they should be going. And when it, uh, as I was saying earlier, like with, if it's a domestic produced um, show, you know, we, we, we can clear that and it's fine, it broadcasts, it's geo blocked and the likes of the player, the three player, the RT player. Um, but do bear in mind, um, as, as, as we were saying, like um, if it does go, if it does get sold on, you know, you need to, you need to cover yourself, you need to make sure that, the, that you have the necessary rights for the necessary territories because the rights are always territorial and make sure that you, you, know, that you meet that criteria. I mean, could I ask you, I mean, obviously here we're talking about master recording rates <coughs> and you have a particular arrangement with broadcasters, which means that uh, the broadcasters are allowed to synchronize master recordings and independent producers selling to broadcasters are allowed to sync, uh, are allowed to uh, uh, attach master recordings, but that only works for the broadcasters broadcast themselves. Yes. And if the film or TV program or whatever else is going out into other media, then a new arrangement has to be arrived at with the owners of the master recordings. And yeah. uh, uh, again, there could be different rights holders in different territories. Um, so you should always ensure that you know you have the right arrangements with the right producers, the owners of the sound recordings. And again, generally, that's whoever pays for the recording. Yeah, and this has presented some problems. I think, uh, or not when I say problems. It works for uh, programs which are made for specifically for broadcasters, but then if those programs are need to be sold somewhere else, I, I'm going to take the example of hate and forgive me anybody who is involved, but I think you have a situation here where certain master recordings are used for the RTE broadcast or were used for the RTE broadcast of Love Hate because there is a license from the PPI which allows uh, the sound recordings to be included. 
but if it came to sell on to other jurisdictions, to uh, other countries, the master recordings then have to be cleared, and in some cases the master recordings might have to be taken out and replaced with a licensed master recording. Would that be right? Yeah, um, I think that's, that's, that's the prime example is, is Love, Hate, um, where as you say, what, uh, what went out on television was not what was delivered on, on the DVD. Um, but again, this is always something that, as, a, as producers, you should always have that fore, foresight to, you know, to make sure that you've covered yourself and that you have the right arrangements, the right agreements in place with the producers of the music. Yeah, I mean, it, it can be very helpful in terms of enhancing the quality of the RTE broadcast of the work. Obviously, it's great to have these master recordings, which in, uh, in many cases, if you, if you watch programs like that, you can see that very popular master recordings are used for uh, the uh, broadcast on RTE, but that then does present problems because those very popular master recordings are very expensive to license if you want to license them for other forms of exploitation, whether it's a sale to a UK broadcaster, to Netflix, to anybody else, that, that then all has to be cleared again, I think, isn't that the particular concern? And again, you'd say from, from a savvy point of view, like you'd say, okay, you didn't know how big Love Hate was going to be at the time, and then s that's possibly why the, the cost associated with, you know, license, getting the correct licensing, that's, that's why it was so high. So again, just, just have, the, have the forethought to, to think of it, you know. Exactly. I think there's also, you can, you know, when you are working on those programs and you're saying, all right, you know, for the RTE broadcast, we're going to avail of the blanket and we're going to use the Beatles or whomever we want to use in the production or in the program. You can also at the same time be thinking ahead and saying, all right, you know, if we see that this could possibly have legs outside of, you know, the RTE broadcast, let's go after it now and get the, the quotes. Let's yeah. try to lock into some quotes now and see what the potential costs are going to be to use that in other media and in other territories. So it's, you know, it is definitely something to think about when you're making you know, when you're producing something. <coughs> Can I ask you something? Sorry. No, go on. Um, just, so do other broadcasters in other territories have these blanket deals then? Or is that very yes. common? They do in the yeah. UK, yeah. yeah. In the UK, <laughs> PPL, for example. Yeah. 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 yeah, they would have their own, their own blanket. So it's PPL yeah. is the UK equivalent of PPI. They have their own blanket license. Um, a lot of the producers, <laughs> like the majors, would be the same as obviously the majors worldwide. Um, okay. And the US? No, no. The US. It's different to the states. <laughs> no. so I was just going to say, so the blanket license won't 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 be everywhere in every territory. The likes of the states is going to be quite different. Yeah. So people will need to go and clear works separately. Okay. You know, so there's no. It doesn't. Yeah. 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 It's, it's it, definitely. It never. It never. I mean, it, it was very much a factor of the day when it was started, which was in a day when you had you know single you know not that many broadcasters yeah. in any particular territory. It only arose in the context of public service broadcasters in particular who were yeah, had significant levels of activity in a country, and that that's I think that's it's a historical thing, but it still exists. Mm. So uh, and it's interesting to see that it does. But mm. the United States, having developed its its you know television broadcasting networks that's in an cool. entirely different way yeah. on a commercial yeah. basis, yeah. Uh, <coughs> there was never that opportunity to negotiate blanket uh, master use <coughs> licenses for broadcasters. Yeah. But Dina, you're, you're, you're on stage, so uh, <laughs> uh, give yeah, us a... Yeah, I mean, I guess just in, in regards to licensing, I mean, I think, you know, if, if you're working on something, if you're producing a project, you know, if you have any thoughts about using popular music in, in the program, I mean, it's, it's from my perspective, it's, it's advisable early on to, you know, speak with a music supervisor if you feel there's going to be a lot of music in the project and have them, you know, if you're working on a film, you know, at script stage, if you, if you have that luxury of, you know, discussing this <coughs> at script stage, going through the script, talking about music, talking about what, you know, stylistically the director feels is, you know, maybe the tone of the music or, you know, the popular music that they're going after in, in the project. Um, and then identifying scenes where, you know, there may be a need for music, if there's music that, you know, if there's anything written into the script, like visual vocal, like, going after that right away and making sure you get that cleared up front so that you're not filming something and then you know you run into a problem that you're going after the rights after it's shot and you can't afford it because it's just it's you know it's not going to work for your budget so you know i think from a licensing standpoint you know those are little things to think about um when you're starting your your projects um the other thing is just in regards to licensing you know there's there can be multiple rights holders on songs. So having somebody who knows how to navigate that, you know, that field is, is an advantage to you. It's, you know, 
On masters, usually there's only one you know, label involved, but there can be split masters. I mean, we've run into that where you know, there's one label that controls it in you know, the US, and then there's another label that controls it for the world ex-US. So you need to get those two parties on board. And then for the publishing, you know, there can be multiple rights holders. Um, so again, it's, I mean, we were talking about the clips. I had a clip that um, I do a lot of work for uh, Discovery in the States, and we did a project, a, a promo for, it was a branding promo for um, Animal Planet, and we used a Kanye West song. And it was a brand new song that had come out. The publishing was still not 100% determined like who had what shares, but there were about nine different rights holders on it. And nobody knew who necessarily had what. So there were a couple guys who had like 1.5%, 2%, so it was just, it was a lot of investigative work. So. You know, knowing how to, to you know get everything to add up to a hundred percent, so that you know you're you're making sure that you're licensing the entirety of that composition, and then also being able to negotiate the fees, going to the publishers and the labels and saying, listen, you know, this is what I'm working on. This is what you know we'd like to spend trying to fill it out and get you know songs to come in on budget. Um, you know, I think on the licensing end of things, those are you know all things to consider. Uh, can I emphasize that from our point of view, when funding a uh, feature film, uh, TV drama, TV animation production, particularly feature film, uh, where people do include significant <coughs> particular types of music, which are very much a vital part of the particular scene that's being shot, I can't emphasize how important it is that those rights are cleared before you even go into the shoot. Yeah. Uh, in other words, they should be pre-cleared at final script stage, because if you go into the shoot, and you haven't cleared it, you can spend two days shooting the, the particular scene and then lose it completely because you can't get the rights for the particular either uh, piece of music or if you're doing it on the basis that a sound recording is specifically referenced or involved. Yeah. Uh, you, and this is something which for us is of huge importance. That, uh, and it's amazing how people completely take for granted that they can write scripts which involve pieces of music which are vitally important to the storyline or the content of the film. <coughs> And which, while I think that's wonderfully creative and absolutely brilliant, if you are going to use somebody else's work, you have to clear it first. So, Dina, yeah, I absolutely. think that's the one. Yeah. On the Kanye West experience and nine <laughs> different parts. <laughs> yeah, it was definitely, it was, it was I, I felt just like a huge sense of relief when I got the last person on board and was able to figure out like the whole piece, you know, all the little pieces of the puzzle. But, you know, it's, it's, just having those relationships, I think, as well with the publishers and being able to talk to everybody and say, listen, like, can you put me in touch with somebody's lawyer? I mean, at the end of the day, it was a lawyer who had all the splits. Yeah. But, you know, it is having those relationships in place and being able to work with everybody to say, all right, like, let's get this locked in so that we can use it in the project. No, absolutely. And I mean, for, from your own point of view, that means that you have ended up with, as I say, with a music cue sheet. Because traditionally what you do is you have the music cue sheet, uh, which is attached to whether it's any form of screen content, you need a music cue sheet. Yeah. Uh, and the, normally what you do is you have the sheet, but then you also have to list all the names on the sheet of who you've got the clearances from and attach copies of the licenses, whether they're synchronization licenses or master use licenses, and you need the whole thing on a PDF or whatever else it is as part of the selling of the particular piece yeah. of uh, audiovisual content. So, and just to give us a quick, that's your job in the world is you arrive along, the producer arrives along to you and says, here's the script and here's the problems. Yeah, I mean, I think every project is different. So, you know, I mean, ideally you're brought on at script stage and you can have those conversations with everybody to say, all right, you know, there's a visual vocal, there's, you know, the director really knows that they want to use this, this, and this in the film. So you can start to identify those things and go after the clearances and, and approvals. Um, but, you know, there's times as well when you're not brought in until post and, you know, there's, you have like, you know, a week to clear something and they really want it in the project. So it's, you know, it's, it's really, you know, my job is to just say, all right, you know, I'm going to do everything I can to get that approved on time and on budget for you. So it's, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, you're kind of brought in at different stages, I guess, just depending on the project and where they're at. Um, but I feel your advice would be to be brought in as early as possible. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, having gone through the, and 
seen how challenging it can be to use uh, you know, a whole series of pieces of music and sound recordings from other people. This uh, leads us very uh, swiftly to the idea that this can be very hard work, but one of the ways of getting to not have to do that is by, of course, employing a composer to compose the music for the film, for the TV drama, for the animation TV series, for whatever uh, form of screen content you're making for the computer game, if that's what you're doing. And as you can see, the challenges to licensing third-party music is sufficiently great that a great solution might be to employ a composer to do it. If I could pass over to Ray, yeah. our composer. Yeah, it's a lot simpler, yeah, as, as are the people who write the music. They're very simple, too. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it is a much simpler way of going about it. You, you literally you pay somebody to do it, and then the contract that you make with that composer is that the music is cleared, publishing, and uh, uh, masters. So it's, uh, it's, it, it is a one-stop shop. Um, it's, it's, it, it, it means that you have to go a particular way, I suppose, in terms of the type of music that you want. Um, but there are like, so many very different types of composers, so you'll always be able to commission uh, the type of music that you like, or you'll find somebody who does what you want. Um, interestingly, what came up there uh, dur uh, during those conversations was the uh, having to, um, r r you know, sometimes the, uh, w when you are commissioned to write music for a film, you're also dealing with other commercial tracks that are used and then they can't be cleared, of course, for, for international use and then you're sometimes asked to replace those. It's a tricky job, it's, it's, that's, that's often, uh, it can be done, it's never quite as satisfying as hearing the original you know, Kanye West tune in there, <laughs> you, but so, often what's needed is you just need to get across the right sort of emotional tone that was originally required. It's never quite as good, or it doesn't have the the impact of uh, a track that everybody knows and loves, and the, the the sort of the baggage that comes with that. That's more. That's often what, why they they they, uh, they use those uh, commercial tracks. Um, so there's and there's other there's other things that you end up doing. Is like um, an interesting one lately is uh, the, again in conjunction with this. This uh, they're, they're working on a film in Sweden, a, a family film where. There's a really popular uh, Swedish singer, and they wanted to use one of a couple of her songs, but they also wanted to use the melody um, of one of those songs as a theme. So they cleared the publishing to use the the melody. So we we'll, we you know we're using that as a hook in 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 as part of the the score. So I have to weave that in throughout the score. The interesting thing about this is that you still have to go back and. Uh, they have final say and clearance to make sure it's used appropriately, and that, that sometimes happens as well. That's an interesting thing that you should always sort of look ahead towards as well. Um, but it is a simpler approach, um, and generally the music is all yours afterwards um, in perpetuity, um, um, and to use in all territories. Give us an idea of the projects you've worked on in terms of, like the feature films, for example, in particular that you've worked on, and just you. What with the producer approaches you at a particular point in time? Yeah, um, generally you're approached by. So um, I worked. So like say for example, the Young Offenders. Peter approached me about. It was late in the project. He had he had cut the film and uh, he called me about three or four weeks before it was due to mix, which is quite tight. Uh, so uh, he he basically said. Uh, I, remember I was driving and I said I'll have a look at the promo he sent me a little promo a brilliant <laughs> promo to, and I, 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 I was bringing my daughter to the dentist and I went home and I watched the promo and then I emailed him immediately I said if you if you if you try and commission anybody else for this I will hunt you down <laughs> <laughs> it was brilliant it was so cool uh, so yeah it's that's what would happen he, he, he you're approached by the director or the producer uh, you often go in and you're pitching against two or three other composers, um, uh, and then if you sit down with the, uh, with the director and uh, hit it off, it's generally the director with feature films that, uh, that the relationship is is built up with. Uh, you, you start work on it. You generally have about six weeks, two months to to uh, to complete a score. Sometimes it's much tighter. Sometimes it's longer. The earlier you're in, the better. Uh, and um, uh, that involves right up to the mix days. You're often still sitting in the studio um, uh, doing tweaks and fixes right up until the last minute. 
Um, but in terms of, again, in terms of clearances and so on, it's probably a much simpler way of going about <laughs> things. <laughs> it's one um, publisher, one... Yeah. And uh, just uh, the other one that I've just noticed from the list, of, and you've done a number of projects, but another one which we were very proud of recently was The Farthest, oh, yeah. which is, a, which is a, yeah. a lovely feature documentary which uh, is about, yeah. it's about um, uh, Mariner, the space Yeah, yeah the, the, yeah, the Voyager spacecraft. Voyager, sorry, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Ema yeah. uh, Reynolds film, yeah. Now, she worked really hard on that for a long time. She had very clear ideas about the music she wanted to use and that, the commercial music in it, yeah. and, the, and, the, uh, and the score as well. So that was that, that that was that that was that, that took a good few months to to uh, to put together. But um, uh, inter that was that was that must have been expensive in terms of clearing the uh, the, uh, the the commercial tracks. These the Carpenters and um, Pink Floyd. Um, but yeah, a great great use of music in that, and particularly the commercial music. Fantastic yeah, film. It's, it's a combination there. Mm. It's an example of where there was significant commercial music, but mm. there was also an underlying soundtrack, yeah. which was the one that you would, were working on. Yeah. Uh, and that's something, again, which is you, get, you can get the best of both worlds that way, uh, while at the same time uh, having that opportunity for working with uh, a composer on the ground, as well as then licensing the tracks. Um, does, does anybody have any questions at this particular point in time in relation to all of this? Yeah. Sorry. Um, well, I can sure shout out. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh yeah. um, I just have a question for, given the fact that we're in the 21st century now, and there's lots of uh, uh, things like web series and kind of you know podcasts and stuff. Um, I, I've been asked to compose music and do stuff for you know online media. Um, so I mean. Strikes me as being a different game. It's not kind of being broadcast through traditional TV or radio channels. So, in terms of protecting, you know, my rights as a composer, what should I do, or what, what in that context, is there anything else I should look at, or any other bodies I should be aware of? Now, to be honest, I don't have much experience with that, um, but it's definitely something we're all going to have to look at as composers because those rights will have to be. Uh, uh, you know, they, they'll, they'll obviously have to be. Um, uh, you know, the, everything will have to be sourced and and and, and cleared and tracked down. Um, the, the, the lads in Imro and MCPS will probably be uh, way better at, <coughs> at, at telling you what to, where, how to go about that uh, than I would at the moment. To be honest, anybody know? I mean, it's. Oh, sorry, JP. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, like in terms of the fees that you would charge, I wouldn't have any idea. That would be really down to yourself. In terms of getting your works registered, though, that's always crucial for you as a composer, is get, get your works registered, make sure they're registered with IMRO. Um, but uh, again, if you're, if, you're commissioned, if you're commissioned to write music directly, you're sort of, your MCPS element is being taken care of directly by yourself, if you know what I mean. So that's the sync deal that you're doing directly, or that you're being paid for directly. But definitely to make sure that your works are registered. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So just, just very briefly, like in addition, Yeah. But then there's the other bits of kind of you know diegetic music, kind of score on the score, whatever. Should I register each one of those pieces of music, even though they're not actual songs? Or oh yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah. How do you register that, those ones? Like As the individual cues? Yeah, the individual cues. Yeah. You give each the, the simplest way. I, the, the way to go about it is with your cue sheet. When there's, there's there will always be a cue sheet filled out with anything like that. Uh, the simplest way is probably to give the. Uh, the piece of music, a name that corresponds to the scene, you know, so, you know, whatever, turtle walking, and just whatever it is, um, and give it a name, and then put it on the cue sheet, its duration, composer, um, you know, publisher, and so on. So that's, the, that's, that's, that's how to register it, and then send that to IMRO. Uh, you can do it digitally, and do it online. So that's the way to make sure everything is done. Oh, sorry. No, I, I, I wanted to emphasize that myself. You know, I mean, the online right for all that it's looked upon as you, it's the, the rules are the same. Mm -hmm. I mean, because it's still about copyright. Mm -hmm. And it's worth going back to the basic underlying principle here, which is that 
There is copyright protection for uh, composers creating uh, music and songs. There's copyright protection for master recordings and there is no greater right to uh, use them on online as opposed to in traditional media and from a, a legal point of view uh, it's absolutely something that can and should be licensed and I mean you're taking services like Netflix or Hulu or uh, all the other new services they have all got uh, licenses in relation to the making available of the works on those services uh, and it's all part of a system whereby they will have music cue sheets they will have licensing arrangements with pub, uh, performing rights societies uh, throughout the world and it's exactly the same system as works for uh, you know, traditional broadcasters, traditional films and cinemas, the old-fashioned DVD, God bless it, um, uh, all of that. This, the licensing is exactly the same online as through the other media uh, system. Sorry, somebody else wanted to ask a question. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, uh, I'm a composer and looking at selling some, some songs online, like some of the, some of the, some of the people who were selling, they were taking like 65%, like where do you go looking for songs uh, or for composers? Um, all kinds of different places really, yeah, it depends, sometimes the director might have somebody that they want to work with already, you know, um, like I've three of the films I've made, we use the same composer that they had a relationship with, um, in terms of songs, uh, I mean, I don't know, it's sort of everywhere, like you hear stuff that you might like, you know, like to so say, I'm just trying to think now the different productions, so like Black Eyes, who made a film <coughs> about boy racers in, in Sligo and Donegal, and uh, I basically asked one of the kids that was we were using his car, this 19 year old guy was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Tell me what this music is. You know, I was just like techno, but you know, it was like, tell us who was it, what are the boy racer? He gave us the top 20. He Facebooked me the top 20 boy racer fave tunes of that year. Like, and I went and <laughs> found a couple of them, you know, interesting is the licensing techno because there's always like samples in there. Yeah. You know, that was yeah. like Quagmire. Anything <laughs> <laughs> electronic music, total Quagmire. So that, I mean, yeah, and, and everything in between, you know, so yeah, and people like yourself email me stuff often, like people email us all the time and say, hey, listen to my music reel and stuff like that, you know, so yeah, 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 all, all of that, research. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'd say definitely, you know, it's worth reaching out to producers, directors, music definitely. supervisors, and just sending your stuff along. I mean, I try to listen to as much as I possibly can. It's, you know, you do get a lot of material sent to you, but, you know, if I meet somebody like in an event and they, you know, tell me they're going to send me their music, I definitely listen to it. So, you know, it's just making those connections where you can and getting, and, you know, these kind of things are a good way to get yourself in front of people and, and you know, just then get your music to them. Thank you. And we certainly want to encourage composers, directors, producers, uh, and writers all working together because, I mean, this, in the end, it's a collective work. One of the greatest joys of film, TV drama production, uh, TV animation production is it's a collective, it's a team game. And unless, I mean, to use the football analogy, unless all of the players, all the 11 players are playing together, it doesn't really work. So uh, for us, it's, this is the team game. And we, I mean, events like this, we very much like to see people uh, networking and being together and talking to each other and meeting each other. And uh, because there's such a wide diversity of creativity out there, that that's very much what we want to do. Um, <coughs> does anybody else have any particular questions? Oh, yeah, sorry. I'm a master rights holder, so I represent the Warner Music Catalog in Ireland, everything from Atlantic Records, Rita Franklin, to the public. <coughs> Just to say that um, I'm available to contact for anyone who wants to clear any Warner Music titles in Ireland. Um, and that's Warner Music Warner Publishing, yeah. Warner Music is the label, so. Oh, it's the label, on yeah. On the master side, yeah. So anything up to Ed Sheeran, down to Rita Franklin, anything in between. That's definitely not because I'm able to get away, but. <laughs> um, it's that look kind of catalog of music that's there. Mm -hmm. But also I also work with um, a roster of commercial Irish artists, there's a couple in front of me, Holy Bird and Marson from the Fusion Lab, represent Soleil um, and uh, Jafaris, a really good uh, roster of Irish talent coming through, so um, I think people are open to being approached and it's very much context driven about what the, what the fee is, you know. Yeah. Um, I've cleared the US rock bands for two, three grand or just use in context of the film. Obviously the trailer is separate, but those kind of rates are available depending mm. on the budget. You know? It's not as expensive as you imagine, I yeah, find. You know, you kind of think oh, it's going to cost tens of thousands, but in actual exactly. fact, when you go into the big labels like yourself, actually there's a sliding scale. It's connected to the budget of your film, isn't it? Yeah, you know? yeah. 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 detail as well. It's, it's 
what you want. Like if, mm. you put, if you want the trailer, don't ask for the trailer use at the end. Have it at the start. If you think you're going to use it, two or three trailers, ask for three. If you want to think you're going to use two in the end, but always ask for the extras that you need. Mm. You know, <coughs> a bit of a cushion for what. But if something happens, then you're kind of covered by like kind of asking a later point in production. Do you kind yeah, of spoke yeah. on that as well? Yeah, I mean, I think it is. Uh, I think it's a really good point. You'd be surprised. You know, there are songs that you may think I could never afford that, but. You don't know unless you go and ask for, you know, a quote and for an approval. And you'd be surprised how low they can come in, you know, for s certain songs. I mean, there are going to be some that are just, you know, they're never going to be approved for, you know, the budget that you're working with. But yeah. a lot of it depends on the budget of your film, the rights you're asking for, um, you know, and the use. I mean, it might be something that when you're sending along your quote request, the way you're positioning the use and you're describing the project, you know, it's something that the rights holder could see it and be like, that sounds really awesome. Like, I want to be a part of that, so. I think artists like to be used in films. If the film is something that they, they like, as you said, yeah. it, it gives them something to talk about. And as long as you're not kind of using a really famous track and not really acknowledging <coughs> what's going before it, that they're open to, to use, you know? Yeah. Well, and I think also, you know, uses in film and television now, it's, you know, it's changed so dramatically in really the last, you know, 10 or so years that, it's more of a marketing tool for a lot of artists that, yeah. you know, radio, it doesn't have the same impact as it did, you know, 20 years ago. So a lot of artists are, you know, they are keen to have their music used in film and television projects. And they will do it. The, the rates have definitely come down from where they were 20 years ago. So, yeah. Um, sorry. No, so Mickey, you were going to say. No, yeah. just can't, because I know there's a lot of composers and musicians in the room. And um, one of the things, just leading off what you're saying and what you've suggested too, about the collaboration, because for the four of the films have been written. No, there's four, yeah, the features that we've done, we've worked with the same composer. And even from the first project, the first film I ever made, which is Sea View, like Dennis McLeod to use his name, and he came on the shoots with us and stuff, and he kinda, you know, sent us music all along and as we were editing he was sending us stuff for ideas. So on one hand you're talking about protecting your music, which is obviously super important, but the other hand you wanna forge these relationships. So that needs to be a little bit of an openness and I think mm -hmm. a collaborative approach, obviously getting three weeks isn't, you know, is a crazy <laughs> hurdle, which is probably really exciting as well. But it, there's another way to do it, is, is, I suppose, is to work with, you know, people who are making short films and just to, to for, forge those relationships. Because we know Dennis from doing a lot of more experimental art film stuff that we did previous to working on features together, you know. So it's just sort of, I suppose, yeah, to be a little bit more, a little bit open about how the work is used. And he particularly was great because he'd send us loads of stuff. And then the tracks would be formed as we were editing, you know, and then, then you go back and remix everything and fi finish everything yeah. properly. And it was just something just to say in terms of the collaboration yeah. between the directors. And, and that's the point. Yeah. It is, it is mm. collaboration between all the creative people working on the project. And if you're, I mean, if you're trying to find a place, I mean, thank you from, from Warner Music in relation to that. Uh, John, uh, <laughs> uh, um, but the, uh, you know, it's in trying to find out, you can actually find out reasonably quickly where who has the master recording rights who has the uh, music publishing rights um you know it's jp and lou would be able to help you in relation to all of these things if it's it's a good place to start put it that way um and you can just very simply even if it's a track you just have the name of the track uh you know you could at least or the name of the composition uh you can make inquiries and find out who who owns it who controls it and that's a quick way then to finding out whether you can use it so I'm from a company called Aura More Music. We do similar to what John does. We compose music, we license music, we supervise music. I'm just wondering, from your point of view, is there looking to be any incentives down the line when you're funding Irish films to use Irish music? Because naturally enough, if people are conceptualising a scene or if someone's writing something, they're always going to think of, say, a prodigy track or something like that. But it's always going to be top of mind awareness. So it's hard to move away from that. And that's what they'll always work towards. But as a result, then, you know, tracks that are there, tracks that are on the radio, tracks on the radio aren't getting the play. You know, not everyone's having their tracks on the radio anymore. Therefore, people don't know they exist. And it's that whole black hole. Can you see the film board, like, creating any sort of incentive for producers or production companies to use Irish music? Uh -huh. Yeah. Oh, yes. Sorry. Yes. It's not only that, but it's also the, the royalties that it, it generates are also going to be kept yes. in the country rather than mm. being airlifted out of the country. Yes. No. I mean, b b b taking first of all, from a creative point of view, we will always encourage uh, you know uh, Irish creative talent to use other Irish creative talent on the project, including music in particular, 
as, as a way of doing it. Very often the challenge in relation to feature films is it is a team game and it's not just a team game, but it's also a game across multiple territories so that you're involved in various ways across um, you know, three or four territories in terms of where you're getting the funding from. Uh, famous examples would include you know, feature films like uh, Room in Brooklyn, which we've been involved in. Uh, 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 Room was a good example of how uh, the music composer relationship is very much a close uh, Irish composer relationship, Stephen Rennix working with uh, uh, Lenny Abramson, and uh, that's a particular kind of uh, relationship which we were very excited about. It's worth mentioning, I don't know if anybody uh, seeing Room would have realised that the RT, you know, an RTE orchestra was used as the performers of um, the music for, in other words, the performance of Stephen's music was done by the RTE orchestra. And again, as Des is saying there, that is encouraged in effect by the system which works in Ireland, whereby it becomes Irish spend and therefore attracts the tax credit in a way that if you do it in Canada or you do it in the UK, it won't attract, attract our tax credit. Now, there are tax credits in other jurisdictions as well too, so this is a complicated balance of where the financing is coming from. But we certainly as a funding agency want to encourage you know, indigenous uh, creative talent to be used across the whole spectrum <coughs> of the production. It kind of feeds on to what I'm saying. So the 481, the using an Irish composer comes into that. Yep. That's why I'm wondering, the licensing of Irish music, will there ever be a... Oh no, the licensing of Irish music from an Irish-based company is qualifying expenditure as far as I'm concerned. <coughs> so that's, uh, that's something that works. In other words, and people will find, and we've had this, where you discover that a large amount of the licensing of the tracks that people have chosen is out of the UK, out of London, for example, or even out of the United States. And that is not qualifying expenditure. And for all the producers in the room, that's, it's worth reminding everybody that that is the case and that you can't claim uh, synchronization licenses and music licenses uh, if you're licensing from uh, uh, companies outside the country as eligible expenditure. Whereas if you license the music from uh, companies which are based in Ireland and have a permanent base in Ireland, that is qualifying spend on. <coughs> sorry, that was a uh, slight. Yeah, sorry. You know, that your, your, your guys' experience with unsigned bands and very in, independent artists and how you contact them and how you find out who owns the rights, etc. If they're not signed, if they, if they don't speak legalese and they never had a contract, how do you deal with that? <coughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, I work with a lot of independent and unsigned artists in the projects that I work on. So, you know, it's really if they're not signed to a label, if they if everything, you know, is copyrighted controlled by themselves, um, then it's just a matter of explaining to them what the project is, what the rights were after are, and just, you know, offering a fee for the use. Um, from there, it's, you know, a matter of just, we do all the paperwork as far as the agreements go. So, you know, getting them the paperwork and signing off on the use for the project. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say outside of that, like, you know, we just, you know, as far as independent music and, and artists go, it's, I mean, it's something that, you know, I'm definitely very keen on using in projects because, you know, you're not always going to be able to afford, you know, very big, well-known artists. So to be able to you know, take a piece of independent music from an artist and use it in the project. And really, you know, it, it gives you in a way in the project a little bit of ownership on that usage, depending if it's, you know, for a promo or, you know, for an advertisement or, you know, a TV show. Um, you know, you do in a way get a little bit of ownership with the use. So it's, I, I definitely love using, you know, unsigned bands and independent artists and what we're working on. Yeah, so same, same really, it's just like that, I suppose if it's, you want to use a track that you know, um, you check out, well they may have had a recorder, they may have recorded it themselves, in Ireland there's so many people who do their own recordings and stuff like that, that you own basically the, all of it, like publishing and the recording, you like that, like just do a deal that you think is fair, that they think is fair, you know, and sort of, you know, yeah, kind of in, in a very similar way that you would with, you know, with new music or whatever, you know, it's kind of, it would be the same sort of process. Um, one of the things actually that's come up in our current production, which is I'm curious to ask you guys about, is uh, so we're commissioning music from a, a composer uh, for the show, a um, different person doing the theme music as it stands, doing all the incidental music, of which is based on the theme music. It's another layer of complication, but we've been advised to become the publisher of the music ourselves. Is that a common thing? 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, every, I mean, just, I think from my experience, yeah. like, you know, I think every project varies. So yeah. I used to work at a TV network in the States and, mm -hmm. you know, we did with a lot of our work for hire deals, yeah. there was an element that we, ha we had ownership on the music. So yeah. the, the composer retained the writer's share, yes, but it was exactly. just a right, you know, it was a flat buyout. So, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. yeah, I mean, I think, it, you know, every project's different. I mean, yeah. I think, Ray, you can also yeah. speak a lot to this. Yeah. Yeah, it does happen. Yeah, sometimes, mm. it obviously, a composer's got to try and retain as much of the, the yeah, publishing yeah. as possible, but yeah. sometimes it's fair if the fee is high enough. Is if, it, if, it's a, if it's a significant enough yeah. fee, then it's, it's only fair that the production company administers mm. or has the publishing administered by somebody and, and collects a portion of it back. Yeah. Actually, with, with um, say, for example, with uh, RTE and I think it still happens with BBC if you're commissioned directly by them that's the standard agreement and I think it's the same with any US yeah. Yeah. show 50% yeah. of it or the you know the, the publisher share goes yeah. to the production I should add as, as well that the Spanish co-producer who is the broadcaster in Spain actually and Catalan is both Spain and Catalan which is interesting in itself interesting. At the moment. <laughs> but anyway that's another conversation but they the TV channels want they retain their share of the publishing themselves and will collect their royalties as well for their little 11 percent and whatever the other 23 percent thing's doing this i tell you spain catalan yeah, i was saying to you guys inside it's, it's really complicated yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. it's been quite something yeah yeah <laughs> um, <laughs> a good thing to do would be to contact the imro distribution team and the membership team as well and talk to them <laughs> about uh yeah publisher yeah, yeah. Be, you know, setting up as a publisher, because there are certain criteria that you'd need to meet in order to set up as a publisher, et cetera, et cetera. So I'd say they'd be the best, best people to talk to yeah. about that. Okay. So do contact the IMRO membership team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. You do get all sorts of deals in that context, actually. I mean, sometimes the producer will suggest a co-publishing deal with the composer so that there are actually... Yeah you're sharing, the composer is sharing on the publisher side as well too, particularly if the, uh, and many composers self-publish, I think is the phrase, yeah. uh, and uh, so you have a combination of the composer as publisher, being a co-publisher with the publisher appointed by the producer, and this is a way in which everybody can participate in the downstream revenues, because mm -hmm. I mean obviously again, and coming back to uh, the complexity of this, uh, the composer, one of the values of the composer composing music for a film is not just uh, the fact that they get paid a fee to do it but that because the performing royalties which, which are collected around the world uh, from the use of the film uh, in uh, <coughs> various territories is money which will also come back to the composer. This is obviously why it's really important from the composer's point of view uh, to be commissioned to do the work and to keep a share of that. And I think just speaking in, in an IMRO context, one of the interesting developments over the recent past has been the great increase in the level of revenues coming back to Irish composer members of IMRO from international uh, exploitation of uh, the music that they've composed for films and TV programs and animation programs. This money is now coming back and increasing significantly is what I think the IMRO experience is. Uh, seeing that Irish composers who've composed music for works and who are members of IMRO are seeing this revenue coming back from uh, the international market. And I think, without speaking for Victor, who I see is in the back of the room, that you have a team currently working, I believe. Well, we, we actually track uh, what's going on internationally, all the structures. Before they even take credit for broadcast, well, we often have the information that they have to be in Europe, And it's, it's a growing area of revenue for um, uh, uh, Irish <coughs> composers as well as a growing area of revenue for Irish producers and for everybody. And I think this is proving the value of intellectual property, speaking in general, but copyright in particular, uh, that if you have a, an ownership of uh, copyright, you have a creative work which is being used in connection with uh, an audiovisual work, a film, a TV drama, a TV animation, a computer game, and these are used worldwide, the opportunities for uh, additional ongoing revenue uh, are quite extraordinary. And uh, <coughs> I think the greater the success of the film or the TV drama series, the greater the success uh, in terms of how it works for the composer as well. Yeah. Farrah. I just wanted to add to that, like, even the comment there, uh, Sarah, the manager, authored a report that showed that 
for IMRO that's available on the IMRO um, website about music for screen in Ireland, but perhaps an underrepresented or underrepresented group is the publisher to Ireland. So if you are looking at retaining publishing, I would recommend you talk to one of the independent publishers in Ireland, and they'll give you a lot of advice. And basically, their role would be to kind of administer your share mm -hmm. and to track it. Yeah. But um, just to say that the local publishers are equally as useful and sure, yeah. do a good job in tracking smaller productions. And also, in terms of using the blanket license, if you are using Irish Act under the blanket license with the broadcaster that you may be getting in touch with them, and they will help promote local productions and as well. So, you know, if you're using a Yeah, no, thank you, sir. Sorry. Um, do, did I see somebody there? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the, yeah, the, the, broad, too, the broadcasters yeah. would report back their, their, <coughs> yeah. their cue sheets back to us. We'd receive cue sheets back from the broadcasters. So the likes of RTE, TV3, TG Car, et cetera, et cetera, will send in all their music returns. That's why it's so important for us to receive all those music returns. And on that cue sheet, it will detail exactly the music was which was used in whatever program. Then the mechanical royalties will be distributed for the sync. And then the performance royalties will be collected and distributed for the performances. So in other words, there's a fee for putting the music into the program, and there's also a fee each and every time that program is broadcast. Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah, is it, is it cheaper like, for a blanket license as opposed to the IMRO license? Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it, like, you get paid less. Well, the blanket licenses are really there to make it easier for producers to use music without having to clear them separately each and every time. So they could, you know, it's... It's a matter of whether they're going to... Yeah, Sean? The best thing to do for an independent production company is to check with the broadcasters from the outset if they're willing to cover it under their blanket. If they are, you're fine. Generally, they will cover it if they are retaining editorial control or financing more than 50% of the production. If they're not willing to cover it, then, as JT put in his presentation, there's a separate fee for independent production company to clear the music directly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, but yeah. the particular thing is it's a conven the blanket license is a convenience thing. Sorry. When they submit their returns, I know on the radio end there's often unclaimed tracks every quarter. We're looking for all, all details have been in, but for radio, for TV, how do you find the compliance in terms of reporting for broadcast? So a lot of that, there is a data collection team, and a lot of the cue sheets will be returned from the broadcasters straight to the data collection team. <coughs> so uh, as far as I know, th those rates are quite high in terms of data returned. Um, but as I say, it really is crucial that even independent producers, if they've been commissioned to make a program for a main broadcaster that they do complete those, those cue, sheets, cue sheets and music returns and send them in to the broadcasters. Yeah. Um, could I just, uh, is, sorry, was, was, was another question? Yes, sorry, my apologies. question for, um, for Ray. Um, I don't know if it, it varies from um, project to project, but I was just wondering how it works. Like I, you know, I'm a songwriter and we've had some, I'm in a band, we've had some like sync opportunities and that's nice and things like that. But for, the first question is how, how separate do you see like a songwriter who writes songs and then going into like uh, you know sc scores or composition for films? And the second question is, um, when if you are commissioned to do a film, do they cover your costs or how does it work? Do you like you know you, you know what I mean? Because like what if you if you create something and then they're like actually we've just 
decide to change direction or, you know what I mean? So those yeah. are my two different weapons. Okay. Uh, so w w do you, were you referring to me uh, or yourself changing from being a songwriter to a, a, a moving into that field as a composer? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Like, it's yeah. more of a question of how separate you see those uh, things. They are they are separate. You do have to think a different way about it. It, t it took a while to, to get my head around it. Uh, so there is a sort of a you know some some people just come right out, right out the shoot doing it like that. that you know it's, some people find it very easy, but there is a sort of a transition. But you have to think about it in a very different way. Um, you do have to churn out a lot of ideas, and that sort of brings on to the next part of your question is that if you if w generally what they do is they give you. Uh, it's an all-in fee. Generally, the, most of the films and TV things I work on, it's an, it's an all-in fee, which will cover your recording, uh, any musicians. Sometimes they give you extra money if it's, you know, for, for large groups of musicians, if, you, if, you, if, if, it, if, if the budget will stretch that far. Um, and then generally, if they do change it, there's chopping and changing all the time. I mean, um, uh, Nicky was saying about your composer, he mm. throws a lot of ideas. That's yeah. generally the way composers have to work. They have to throw a lot of ideas just simply so that they can find the direction, a common direction for producer, director uh, and composer, and, you know, in terms <coughs> of what can do, c you can do. So in the early stages, you're often firing out lots and lots of different ideas, all wild cards, and then you'll narrow it down. And then sometimes they do change direction and you have to start again, <laughs> but it's all covered, you know, by this. So Yep. I guess what the yeah. picturing like going to the studio, calling everybody, getting all the no. and then giving it and then they're like actually. Yeah, no, you could that's like yeah, it. no, that wouldn't really be feasible. It's generally done from a home studio. That's the way I'd work. Most oh. most composers would. They work and they demo up uh, you know, basic ideas before <coughs> you start properly recording them uh, with, with live musicians if you get there. So it's you, you mock ups. You call them mock ups, you know, that's what you do. Is there any other questions from anybody? C could I suggest we might just have a quick um, uh, run through uh, any final comments that any of the panel would have in relation to uh, what we've talked about uh, today? I think it's it's a complex subject, and I realise it raises a lot of questions. I mean, uh, if there are, if anybody, as I say, has any questions, please don't hesitate to ask, because I think there's a lot of things here which there's a lot of very experienced people here who can help with any questions you have. Uh, but while people are thinking about, oh, yes. Um, Ray, can I just ask you, if you're commissioned to write music for a film or a series or something like that, does that stay with that production for the lifetime of that production? Yeah, okay. yeah, so you perpetuity. Can't take yeah. Pieces of music out and sell it or bring it back to yourself or anything? Uh, no, it's it's generally you grant them the use. Sometimes it's exclusive, sometimes it's non-exclusive. Most of the times it's <coughs> non-exclusive. So they but they have the right to use that for as long as the film exists and in all territories. That's generally the deal. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's an interesting area about restrictions on re-recording of when you can re-record the work or yeah. when you can re-license the work, yeah. and that sometimes becomes an interesting discussion because, as I think. Uh, JP was pointing out the sometimes there are tracks which become very famous as particular pieces of music as intro music which could and this is just a question sometimes for producers to recognize that uh, you you know you license a piece of music as an intro for what you think is this you know a short TV series that you're going to do called mastermind for the sake of <laughs> argument um, and all of a sudden you realize you just simply license it out of library music and then it starts to become the theme song or the theme music for the particular series and it gains a reputation within itself and then what you're afraid of of course is that somebody else will start to use it for other purposes and that becomes a challenge in itself so mm -hmm. there are many discussions which have to take place about uh, music which is composed or music which is synchronized as to whether it's exclusive or non-exclusive because as you can see things can become very quickly a branding thing for a particular uh, type of uh, product, for example. Uh, this happens particularly in commercials and advertising. Is anybody from here from commercials or advertising, which is a, another area which is, has its own challenges? Any particular challenges that you're aware of? Yeah, it was actually a question I was going to ask is um, branded content is becoming more common where, you know, outside of traditional advertising, you know, 30 second spots, you might get short films being made that could be online, cinema, or even on TV. And, you know, there's challenges around that. And if the panel has any pointers on that, because a lot of the time, uh, advertisers want certainty and, you know, I'm paying for that and I want it forever on every platform and so on and so forth. And obviously, particularly with stuff going on to YouTube, 
uh, you know, on the video platforms, um, it's very difficult to call it back in again, you know, if it's licensed for a particular um, period of time. So the, the challenges around that is whether there's any pointers or any well, more yeah, it, just. The world. If we go back to the, to the three categories of music, so either you've commissioned somebody to write it, or you're using commercial music, or you're using library music. With the likes of com commercial music, it's exactly that. So you're gonna license it for a certain period of time, and you're gonna li license it for a certain media, for a certain territory. But with production music, it's totally different. So you could license all media in perpetuity as branded content, and there is a category for branded content on the rate card. So you could license production music, both of the rights, the publishing and the sound recording right, for library music in perpetuity. So it does, it's, a, it's, a, it's an easier way to license music in that regard. Um, it's not commercial music, they're not gonna be like extremely well-known tracks, but there's so much to choose from in terms of library music and production music. So you could put in, you could go onto one of the websites like West One Music or EMI Production Music, Warner Chapel Production Music, and you could put in your metadata search and you could search for the kind of music that you want. Unless you approach Ray and ask for a nice jingle or a nice uh, commission piece. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. it might be of help is that some publishers will only charge you when it's being promoted. So the content will exist and it will sit there online, but you'll have to give them the duration that it's being promoted on certain platforms. So it's being pushed out then. So it might be sitting somewhere quietly online, but unless you're actually paying for it to be promoted, they won't charge you for it. Okay. 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 Yes. Hello, Michael. Um, if you have, say, like a public domain piece of music, and say if one of your actors in the film is singing it, performing it, are you obligated to register that with Imo? To register, uh, well, what you're doing is you're, you're using an out of copyright work. So if it's out of copyright, there is no copyright as such. Do you know what I mean? So you're free to use it in the film so long as there's no existing recording of it and there's no existing registration of it. You could register that uh, as, as your own arrangement of that out of copyright work, because then that could be included on the cue sheet, and any time the film is broadcast, performance royalties would go back to the original composer, or whoever it is that's making the original arrangement. It's the arrangement, yeah. So you yeah. could end up ha oh, uh, yeah, be earning from that arrangement yourself. So. Yeah. yeah. I I think it's probably worth emphasising that this area of traditional arrangements is a complex one, um, and uh, the you can you there are, for example, a significant number of copyright registrations for I think just to take the example, of Danny Boy, I think, is there are various versions of that registered. It's obviously a public domain work because it goes. Well, I think it is a public domain work, isn't it? Uh, yes, and then yeah, it, it is. Goes, yeah. Uh, but then, so therefore, a number of people have registered their traditional arrangements of the song. Uh, sometimes it's difficult to distinguish one from the other, and that presents certain challenges. Uh, so that, uh, on the other hand, I think the example you used, actually, JP, of the um, whiskey in the jar, which is a particularly unique version, recognisable version of a traditional song, which is recognisably the Thin Lizzy version, which you can everybody would know. Oh, yeah, that's the Thin Lizzy version. So. Traditional arrangements can present certain complexities about whether, um, you know, particular versions of songs. I mean, the theoretical legal position is that if you have a traditional arrangement, if you sing it flat as a traditional arrangement, there's no copyright, no copyright arises, and it's a public domain work. In the same way, if you decide to write, you know, recite Shakespeare in your film, <coughs> you don't have to pay Shakespeare's descendants because <coughs> it's long since out of copyright. Uh, on the other hand, if you do a particularly creative version of a public domain work, that is the reason why there's an argument for saying that you've created a new copyright work, which is a recreated traditional work. And I think that's part of the reason why. And Ireland has made a particular reputation for itself as the creator of uh, well redeveloped works based on public domain works. And I come right the way back to Whiskey in the Jar as a very good example, which I think everybody would recognize very quickly as. It's a, traditional, it's a traditional song, I believe, but it's obviously so recognisably something that was performed and created by Thin Lizzy that that's, that's why you now have a copyright, which is a new copyright created by, composed by Thin Lizzy in relation to that particular song. And that's, that's the 
explanation for our traditional arrangements, but it is interesting that we in Ireland have been particularly active in this area of traditional arrangements. Um, yes, sorry. Yes, I would say if you have access to the PRS music um, website, that's great, PPL as well. Um, also, I mean, just in the States, ASCAP and BMI have basically the same resources. So, you know, those are all, and CSAC as well. So those are all really good resources to just track down who controls the copyright on the songs. Yeah, I think I have a, a little list of, of, of websites that you can log in <laughs> without, uh, like, setting up a username and password and, and, and that kind of thing. There is um, uh, the ISWC. Uh, I can send you a link. If I get your email address, I can send you a link to some of these. Oh, yeah. Great. Yeah. So there are a couple of databases that you can use that, you, that don't require a login, that you can go in and see who the original <coughs> writers are. Uh, you don't always get the publishers because it's going to be. Yeah. Yeah, it's the other thing I would just say really quickly with a lot of those databases, you know, they're going to list what's, you know, they're going to have certain information listed, but it's not always accounting for 100% of, especially with the publishing, for 100% of the composition. So when you are clearing music, you want to make sure that you're getting everybody to quote what, how much of the song they represent. Because sometimes they might only represent 40%, you have another, you know, publisher that represents 30%, and then you have to make up for that remaining portion. So you know, it's important to make sure you're accounting for 100%. And for all territories of the world as well, too, because as, yeah. as Dina says, sometimes you have situations where it's owned for one territory by one exactly. bunch of people and another territory for another bunch of people. A lot of times with publishers, you have where, you know, somebody controls it just for, you know, it could be for the U.S. and South America, and then another publisher controls it for Europe and Asia. So it's just, you know, making sure everybody's, you know, accounting for what they control and what they represent. Absolutely. <coughs> Man at the back. Um, I don't know the tone, but uh, I think there is no money involved. <laughs> 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 like I work for a, a charity at the moment, and um, it's a very important uh, film with them. And um, I'm, it's in a gym, and there's constantly music on, and this is like the music. Like. So we're, we're making our own thing. Would you be given a license on the, the idea that the film could become a success down the line by the, the, the artist or the, the manager holder could be the license? I think the short answer is that all these things are possible if you can persuade the relevant owners to agree to do it. I mean, like the, I mean, I remember certainly going back to a complex time when there, were, there used to be uh, albums and singles sold uh, or created for charitable purposes where you um, uh, got a whole load of very famous people to create uh, an album and the whole idea was that everything would be uh, you know uh, given to charity it's a complicated uh, negotiation because in the final analysis you do need the permission of all the people who own the copyright in the music and the copyright in the master recordings to give you consent and while I think we can always say that, you know, if there is good reason for doing it, may, maybe publishers and master use or master, um, uh, master rights owners would be prepared to do it. I think it's a case by case basis, really. But you would definitely do a, public, a charity rate across most of the catalogs. Um, I guess if there's only going to be on certain distribution, you could get the experience for that. And then, as you say, if you wanted to have an album, if you've got commercial cut through, you could have a step up license for that, maybe. <laughs> Good man from Warner's, definitely. Um, and I think you know a lot of artists will yeah. agree to let their music be used on a gratis basis, especially for charity projects. Yeah. Um, you know, there are ways you can work it as well. That you know, if if there's any way you can chiron, you know, the artist information at the end of the project or you know the video, that's always a bonus, just as a little trade off. Um, yeah. Mentioning them on any kind of social media promotion that you're doing, it's you know there's ways to kind of make it a little bit you know, sweet for them if they're giving it to you for free. The one thing that's being debated at the moment is where a lot of brands are getting behind 
charity project, and it's still about the brand. And obviously, they're a multi-million pound <coughs> worldwide brand, and it's part of their, I guess, their program that there's a certain amount of involvement campaign. So it's a fine line between what's actually a full charity project and what's brand and content around the cause that the brand are also <coughs> to, to promote the brand. Yeah. So no. And there is obviously a trade-off in all these things, which is one of the things, it's all about promotion, it's all about <coughs> visibility, it's all about eyeballs, mm -hmm. and who's looking at uh, uh, what in terms of what's on the screen. Um, yes, sorry. Um, this is for Dana. I'm just wondering if you think that music supervisors for major feature films would be deterred from using music that's already been released, <coughs> A, and B, say, music that's been synced to ads or um, smaller productions before. No, I mean, I definitely not. I mean, I think it's always, I mean, I think there, there's cases when if a song is just so overused in, you know, it's used in a lot of different campaigns and films and programs, then it might be something that, you know, you might steer away from for a while um, just with, you know, pitching it for projects. But, you know, it really ultimately comes down to what, you know, what the producer and the director are looking for. What, you know, what's the, the goal with what you're trying to achieve with the music in, in a scene or in a, you know, an advert or what have you. And just finding the right, you know, the right piece of music for that. So it's, I think you know, you're always open to everything. It's really ultimately finding that right piece of music. Um, anybody else? Any questions? Yes, sorry. I think the best thing to do again would be to contact a membership department. Talk to uh, Keith and David in the membership department and they should be able to, if they can't help directly, they, they will at least be able to point you in the right direction. I don't know of any contract templates that, we'd, that we would have like that, but I wouldn't be the best person to, to answer that. As I say, contact the membership department and they should be able to help you. Yeah. And uh, just just to say from the like we we, we are often approached by um, by our members um, so again they could be self releasing artists and they don't know they can't value they don't know how to value their their product and they don't know how to pitch it or what they should be charging or what what uh, templates to use but you just r recommend them to look at other artists that are in the similar markets who have had similar agreements with producers in the past and see what sort of deals that they that they struck with them and try and find a fair a fair balance you know. Dean was saying earlier as well, I mean, the burden is on the producers to, to give you guys contracts, the legal, you know, the, the, the legal, um, huh? We are the producers. Oh, you are the producers? Okay. <laughs> I can I actually, uh, yeah. I can talk to you if you want about just agreements in general for productions and, um, yeah, but it is, yeah, a lot of times it's really, the production is going to be, you know, is going to want their own agreement for licensing the music because you want to yeah. make sure there's certain criteria included in that agreement, so. Yeah, I mean, sorry. Yeah. And no, just to be clear, I mean, very, very often, I mean, obviously, the, if you're a producer and you're dealing with a well-known music publisher, they will present you with a contract uh, yeah. or a master use. I mean, yeah. our, our colleague in Warner Brothers there would, normally they would present you with a contract if they're licensing music to you. Yeah. On the other hand, if the producer is dealing with an independent artist or dealing with, you know, an unsigned band or, you know, people who are just working, uh, normally it's, it's for the uh, producers or their lawyers to produce contracts to deal with that particular situation. So that's, that would be the way. I mean, obviously you may need to get somebody to look over it from your own point of view, but uh, equally from a practical point of view, at least you'd be supplied with a form of agreement which you would then be able to read and understand. And I'm speaking here in, in the, on behalf of the producers, that would be the expectation, would be the producers would themselves come up with the contracts if it was dealing with unsigned or independent um, uh, music <coughs> composers or uh, music or master recording owners who weren't signed to anybody. Does anybody else have any questions? Person in the back. Yes, right in the back. Uh, I don't think, I, I need to double check, but I don't think um, commercial music is going to be covered for promos on Facebook. Uh, production music would be, but um, as, far as, I, as, far as, I can, as far as I know, I don't think it's going to be covered on, on, on Facebook. The blanket will cover 
if it's covered under the main broadcaster's blanket, it's going to cover the main broadcaster's area. So it's going to cover uh, their online platform and their YouTube channel. But I don't, <coughs> yeah, but I don't think it's going to cover, it's not going to cover Facebook, no. Sean, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Um, if this, indeed. <laughs> um, if I, I was going to ask the panel just for a last contribution from everybody, just simply any final thoughts uh, before we wrap up, and that will give people a chance to think of any final questions they might want to ask. Uh, can I go to you, JP? What's sure. Yeah. Um, I guess I think uh, it was a qu a quite a quite a, a whistle stop tour, uh, as you said, of music licensing for audiovisual in the presentation. But I think the key points really are. What type of music is it and who are the rights holders? And as soon as you figure out those things, it's so much easier to put everything else into place. So what type of music is it? Is it, is it commissioned music? Is it commercial music? Is it production music? And who are the rights holders? Uh, again, uh, I'd be the main point of contact here for any production music, library music queries that you'd have. So my, uh, you can call the main IMRO line if, you, if you're looking to license any production music. And uh, yeah, I think that's it. Thanks, JP. Luke? Um, yeah, just like JP, um, you know, reach out to ourselves um, at PPI if you are if you're producing music and if you and if you want to get some some advice or if you, or if you're if, if you're producing film, uh, TV, get in contact with us and we can try we can try and be the be the link between the producers. And just from a from, from a producer's point of view, I would just say and coming back to an earlier point was that if you are you know working to tight deadlines have backup have backup uh, versions of recordings or different versions of recordings that you might want to put into your edit and and don't don't always be relying on on that one version that you need you know thanks ray thank you uh, yeah from a uh, composer's point of view um it, it's 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 an obvious one stop shop for 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 producers and directors um it 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 gives you flexibility a lot of flexibility within that um regarding build a composer trying to you know um uh, 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 make relationships with producers and directors it's i'd suggest doing as much work as you can with short films i know it involves uh doing stuff for free initially and for very little money but that's where you build up those relationships with your peers and it, they really do pay off if you keep at it um and that's a two-way street it's really beneficial for the directors when because then you have a shorthand uh, when 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 you get when you get down to uh, working under pressure, there's uh, you don't have to learn how to talk to uh, somebody. And when you have uh, you know when you work with somebody on a regular basis, it becomes much easier and quicker uh, over over time. So use a composer. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, I would just say you know don't be afraid to use commercial music either in your projects. Um, it really you know. There's a lot of great music out there that you may not know about as well. So having a music supervisor on board to kind of guide you through that process and say, all right, you know what, maybe you can't afford this track, but here's B, C, D, E, F, which you were saying, which I wanted to bring up, having the backups, which is great. Definitely have, when you're working on something, have backups in place, but be open to different types of music because there's some great, I mean, there's amazing Irish artists that are producing phenomenal music here. And it, you know, there's some great opportunities to have that music in your production. Thank you. So, thank you, yeah. Nikki. So you said all the things I was going to say, <laughs> but um, I suppose there's a couple of questions. But uh, is like where to find music? You asked a couple of people asked that. I mean, do you still do those showcases of kind of Irish music? Do you guys still do those? Keith, it's yeah, just, yeah. Yeah, that's a good. Keith Johnson. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's a good place to try and find Irish talent. There's also. Uh, Facebook groups like we work in Irish film and TV, for example. You go look or looking for this kind of music for a series, you know, and just kind of network that way, you know, is a really good way to kind of discover, you know, people that you haven't heard about before, you know. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and if I could say, lastly, on behalf of the Irish Film Board, that we really do are excited about the future for uh, Irish creative talent working in film, <coughs> and that includes composers, editors, uh, music supervisors, all the people who are working. Uh, in the uh, sound recording business, I think from our point of view, uh, we want to see as much of that creative talent included in films as can be done. Um, sir. And I just wanted to say, we do have feedback for the back of the room. We have been speaking to you know, about further kind of seminars and uh, training sessions for music and film and things that we'll bring.
filmmakers and composers together. So if you want to send out feedback for now, uh, future kind of training ideas, please send a piece of music and film specific. Um, or else you can email us with any of that feedback as well. So okay, thank you. Could I thank everybody? First of all, could I thank the panel? Uh, a round of applause, I think, for the <laughs> I'd like to take this opportunity also to thank, uh, as I did earlier, Imro for the use of the hall, which is very much appreciated, Victor in particular, and all his team. <laughs> and last, but by no means least, uh, Screen Training Ireland, my colleague in particular, Sir Philip Nan from Screen Training Ireland, and I think this has been a very useful conference, and I hope everybody gained uh, useful information, valuable ways of looking at things, uh, and could I wish everybody great success in the work that they're doing in the future. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you.